Today, the continent of Antarctica is situated directly over the South Pole and is completely glaciated. But it wasn't always this way. The southern continent has moved here after millions of years of tectonic activity and continental drift, and was once home to dense forests and even the most famous extinct organisms of all time, the dinosaurs. Antarctica was once part of the ancient supercontinent Gondwana land, or just Gondwana, along with South America, Africa, Australia, Zealandia, and the Indian subcontinent, aka Hindustan. Around 330 million years ago, during the Carboniferous period, Gondwana had merged with the other major landmasses to form an even larger supercontinent, Pangaea. Surrounding Pangaea was the global ocean, Panthalassa. A consequence of all the continents being merged is that there is far less coastline, meaning the central areas of Pangaea are robbed of moisture from the ocean. As such, Pangaea's centre was an enormous, scorching, inhospitable desert. Pangaea would persist for the entirety of the following period, the Permian, which lasted from 299 to 252 million years ago. The Permian, however, ended in disaster. Its colloquial name of the Great Dying is for good reason, as it is believed that around 90% of all living organisms on Earth died out, the most catastrophic mass extinction event in the history of the planet. The cause is thought to have been the eruption of the Siberian Traps, a large igneous province in what is now Russia, spewing molten lava and massive quantities of harmful volcanic gases into the atmosphere, robbing the ocean and animals of oxygen and blocking out the sun for photosynthesis. Having been left for dead, life at the beginning of the following Triassic period was thin on the ground. Since the Great Dying, the few survivors found themselves in an incredibly hot and dry world. Today, Antarctica is seen as one of the most inhospitable places on the planet, yet in the early Triassic, it was sanctuary. Whilst much warmer than today, Antarctica was much cooler than other parts of Pangaea due to it being close to the South Pole. The milder climate seems to have given plants and animals refuge in the wake of the Great Dying. This information is based on fossil finds from the Fremu Formation in what is today the Transantarctic Mountains. This area was once a floodplain, myriad rivers surrounded by forests. The remains of plants such as cycads, horsetails, ferns, and the now extinct seed ferns show no signs of being adapted to cold environments, suggesting this area was indeed much warmer at this time. Feeding on these plants was by far the most abundant animal of the time, Lystrosaurus. Lystrosaurus was a type of dicynodont, a group of herbivorous synapsids or stem mammals unrelated to reptiles or dinosaurs. It is the perfect example of a disaster taxon, an organism that survives a disaster of some sort, in this case the Permian extinction, and then proliferates in the aftermath, accounting for a staggering 95% of the terrestrial animal biomass in Lystrosaurus's case due to the lack of competition. The fact that Lystrosaurus was so abundant in Gondwana even helped support the theory of continental drift, as it was a land animal and was deemed unlikely to have been able to swim from Antarctica to South Africa or India as they are today, meaning they must have reached these places by walking whilst they were connected. Alongside the many species of Lystrosaurus was fellow dicynodont Myosaurus, not to be confused with the dinosaur Myosaura. There were more than just herbivores in Antarctica at this time, however. Thrinaxodon was a type of cynodont, another type of synapsid that is very close to our own mammalian ancestry. This fox-sized carnivore is thought to have mainly fed on insects. Sharing these ecosystems with the synapsids were ancient reptiles, further supporting the theory that Antarctica was warm. One such reptile was Prolacerta, which despite resembling a lizard, was actually more closely related to the archosaurs, the lineage that would lead to crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. It was 50 centimeters long and thought to be a swift insectivore, 
Another such reptile was the iguana-sized Antarctinax, which was only recently named and described in 2019. It too is thought to be related to the archosaurs, and its discovery has made scientists theorise that the archosaurs must have long lineages extending back into the Permian that have yet to be discovered, known as ghost lineages. There is also a large, poorly known reptile known from the Fremu formation, which may have been the top predator, but it's too poorly understood to say conclusively. Patrolling the waterways were temnospondyl amphibians, such as Cryobatrachus and Cryostega, which would have looked like crocodiles crossed with salamanders. Despite being warmer at this time and further from the South Pole than it is today, Antarctica still would have undergone the annual phenomena of midnight suns, where the sun does not set for several months in summer, and polar nights, where the sun does not rise for several months in winter. Researchers have noted that many of the animals found at Fremu were smaller than their Permian forerunners and were burrowers. This may have been how they coped with the polar winter. By reducing their body size, they would have had a much lower caloric intake, meaning they could cope better when food was scarcer during winter. They could also hibernate or enter a state of torpor to sit out the cold months in the safety and insulation of their burrows. Millions of years later, the Earth recovered, and the reptiles proliferated and took over the planet. Among them were the first dinosaurs. At the end of the Triassic period, another mass extinction occurred, caused by massive volcanic activity due to North America separating from Africa, the first stage of Pangaea's breakup. This event wiped out a lot of the reptiles, but not the dinosaurs. The world's ecosystems went from those where dinosaurs were simply parts of communities in the Triassic to those of the Jurassic, dominated by dinosaurs alone. The dinosaurs' reign over the Earth included Antarctica, as proven by fossil finds from the Hansen Formation on what is now Mount Kirkpatrick in the Transantarctic Mountains, dating to the early Jurassic, around 185 million years ago. It was around this time that Gondwana was also breaking up, made evident by volcanic rocks found here as a result of the Karu and Fera large igneous provinces, regions of volcanic activity in South Africa and Antarctica, respectively. These formed due to plate tectonics causing Africa to separate from both Antarctica as well as Madagascar and the Indian subcontinent around this time. The separating continents, however, created new seaways and moisture for inland areas. As a result, the Jurassic was much more humid than the Triassic. The Hansen Formation was deposited near an active volcanic fault in a rift valley that would one day become the Transantarctic Mountains, dividing East and West Antarctica. Throughout the Triassic, Pangaea had been drifting northwards, meaning Antarctica was warmer than it had been in the early Triassic. This warmer, humid environment supported large conifer forests with monkey puzzles and podocarps. The understory would have consisted of ferns, tree ferns, mosses, and club mosses. Feeding on these plants was Glacialosaurus, a sauropodomorph dinosaur that was a relative of Platyosaurus, Massospondylus, and the later true sauropods. At six meters long, it was a large animal for the time and would have used its long neck to browse on the conifers. Interestingly, there are unnamed bones assigned to true sauropods from the Hansen Formation. The apex predator of this environment was the crested theropod dinosaur, Cryolophosaurus. Its placement on the theropod family tree has been all over the place. The most recent study places this carnivore as more derived than Coelophysis, but more basal than Ceratosaurs and Tetanurans, with its two closest relatives being Zupesaurus from late Triassic Argentina and Dilophosaurus from early Jurassic North America. Cryolophosaurus was actually the first dinosaur named from Antarctica. There have also been remains of other theropods similar to Coelophysis found here, but these have not been thoroughly named or described yet. There is also a presumed Ornithischian dinosaur from this location that has yet to be described. The Hans Formation also yields a flying pterosaur similar to Dimorphodon from the early Jurassic of England that has yet to be described and named. There was also a Tritilodont cynodont said to be similar to the modern Wolverine. Millions of years later, towards the end of the Cretaceous period, the age of the reptiles was coming to an end. 
Regardless, dinosaurs continued to thrive on the continent and had diversified massively over the last 100 million years or so, with one group evolving into modern birds. Whilst Cryolophosaurus was the first dinosaur from Antarctica to be named, Antarctopelta was the first to be discovered. It was a type of ankylosaur, four-legged herbivores covered in heavy armour. For many years, it was thought that ankylosaurs came in one of two forms, the ankylosaurids, which were bulky with thick bony clubs at the end of their tails for swinging at predators, and nodosaurids, which lacked tail clubs but had spikier armour. When Antarctopelta was described, they were unsure which group it belonged to, as it didn't have any truly distinctive features of either group. This was shaken up by the discovery of Stegoros, a small ankylosaur from the late Cretaceous of Chile, with a distinct tail club that reminded its describers of the Aztec weapon Macuahuitl. They also found that Stegoros shared similarities with Antarctopelta, as well as Cunbarosaurus from Australia. This led them to coin a new group, the Parankylosauria. This group seemed to be endemic to Gondwana, and suggests that South America and Australia were able to exchange fauna via Antarctica, as the three continents were all still connected at this time. The remains of Antarctopelta were found in the Santa Marta Formation in what is now James Ross Island in the Antarctic Peninsula, dated to around 75 million years ago. Strangely, it consists of marine sediments and it is believed that an Antarctopelta was washed out to sea by rivers before it sank to the seabed. Inhabiting this sea was the marine lizard Taniwasaurus, a type of mosasaur adapted to the cooler waters closer to the South Pole. It shared these waters with Eubostrichoceras, I think I'm pronouncing that right? An ammonite cephalopod with an exotic helically wound shell. In the slightly younger Snow Hill Island formation, also of James Ross Island, the ornithopod dinosaurs Morosaurus and Trinisaura were found. These were both roughly three meters long and were thought to be fast bipedal herbivores. It is possible they had a covering of feathers to keep them insulated in their relatively cold climate compared to the rest of the world in the late Cretaceous. They would have lived alongside the bird-like theropod Improbator. Not much is known about this animal as it is only known from a single left foot, but estimates put the entire creature around a similar size to Utah Raptor at around three to four meters long. Unnamed titanosaur bones have also been found in this formation. Their discovery marked the finding of sauropod fossils on every continent. An unidentified pterosaur is also known, thought to be an Asdarkid, similar to Quetzalcoatlus. They would have lived in coastal forests of mixed conifers like monkey puzzles and podocarps, but likely also species of the flowering plant Nothophagus, the southern beach. These are all members of the Antarctic flora, a specific community of plants that thrive in the landmasses that once constituted Gondwana. Today, these places include Southern South America, Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia. They thrived in Antarctica as well until the entire continent became glaciated in the Ice Age. Together, they formed the Antarctic Floristic Kingdom. The Lopez de Bertadano formation was deposited at the very end of the Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago, when it is thought a massive meteorite named the Chisulub Impactor struck the Gulf of Mexico, and the resulting devastation caused the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, as well as many other large reptiles. This is made evident by the discovery of iridium deposits here, Iridium is very rare on Earth, but is common in asteroids, suggesting it is debris from the meteorite impact. Living alongside Morosaurus were ancient birds, some of which already resembled modern groups and may even belong to said groups. One such example is Vegavis, thought to be very similar in lifestyle to modern waterfowl such as ducks, and may even be a true member of this group which would suggest that modern bird groups may have already appeared by the late Cretaceous. It was most likely aquatic and fed on small fish and crustaceans. Another bird, Polaronis, may have been a stem loon, similarly thought to die for fish due to it displaying osteosclerosis, aka dense bones, a common adaptation for diving. This suggests that some modern bird groups were not only present during the Cretaceous, but seem to have lived through the extinction event at the end of the period, 
relatively unaffected. This just about concludes an approximate history of dinosaurs in Antarctica, a fascinating world lost to ice. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Bye bye now.